All right, you think we're ready to start, Becky? Um, well, let's just give it another minute. Um, we, have, we, we only have 19 participants. Let's just get, uh, give it another minute. Sounds good. Can I say a word while, our, while we're waiting or should I wait till after? I, I, think, the, I think we're gonna start in just two minutes. Okay. okay just one minute actually, um, and then I'll get started. So if you could- That's City before. Council 95 and the buildings and maybe a reason for the wrecks, which would be a reason why the city's going for the mega dam. Mm. Okay, I think uh, we should get started. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Becky Bartovix, and I am a, a longtime volunteer for Sierra Club Maine. We've been working with um, North American Megadams Resistance Alliance for the last, last few years, and um, we're really happy to bring you this program to talk about uh, the, uh, what the Megadams have done in our world. Um, and uh, we want to uh, recognize that uh, tonight is uh, program is dedicated to the memory of Boyce Richardson, who died um, in March of 2020. He, um, Sierra Club actually um, encouraged him to write a book about the work that he had done um, uh, called James Bay, The Plot to Drown the North Woods, um, which he published in, in 1972. The, this has to do with the damage to the um, Cree land, violating the Cree, Cree land rights um, to build the um, hydro power in James Bay. And um, he was renowned for the work that he did working with the indigenous peoples of Canada. And we want to recognize his incredible effort. Um, he was very well known and um, I encourage you all to look at the work that he has done. Um, Thank you again for, for coming and um, we want to uh, start the program. I just want to say that if you would put your questions, please mute everyone. And if you would put questions in the chat box, I will try to uh, curate the questions at the, um, in the end of the program and uh, after we've heard from our speakers. Uh, and um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Meg Sheehan. Um, and Meg, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you, Becky, and thank you, Sierra Club Maine Chapter, for having NAMRA participate in this community conversation. My name is Meg Sheehan, and I am coordinator of the North American Mega Dam Resistance Alliance. Our mission is to protect rivers and their communities by resisting mega dams and their transmission corridors. Dams should not be part of any climate plan or Green New Deal or carbonization pathway. Hydropower is not a climate solution, but a climate disaster. Dams are also a humanitarian disaster because they displace people by flooding vast areas of river systems, forests, wetlands, and alder river systems that people rely on for food and cultural survival. For millennia, Indigenous people in the sub-Arctic North, where, Canadi where Can Canadian hydro dams are located, survived by navigating rivers in winter and summer to fish, hunt, and trap. This is the region where Hydro-Quebec and the other Crown corporations have massive dam systems that are being used for export, including over the North of the New England Clean Energy Connect or the CMP project through Maine. 
So now due to the dams in these vast areas, the summer flows and the winter ice no longer follow a seasonable, seasonal pattern, but fluctuate dramatically, dangerously, and sometimes in a deadly way due to dam controls that make it nearly impossible to conduct traditional hunting, fishing, and trapping on the river system. Dams cause waterways to become polluted by altering the river flows and creating stagnant pools of deadly toxins and algae blooms. Across Canada, as a result, hydropower dams have polluted the drinking water systems for many, many communities. I also want to talk about climate justice in U.S. energy policy, specifically the main CMP corridor. Hydropower dams are located in remote areas and the communities are marginalized, not only lacking clean water to drink, but often electricity and access to modern communication. In Quebec province, where the electricity for CMP will come from, over 50% of Hydro-Quebec's dams are built on stolen indigenous lands. The state-owned monopoly, Hydro-Quebec, is facing billions in damages claims from at least six indigenous communities and First Nations. Canadian hydropower is part of Canada's legacy of colonialism and racism and is a form of resource extraction like tar sands and mining. Indigenous people were, were removed from this land by colonial settlers who built an economy on hydropower, timber, mining, and extraction. The government to this day subsidizes these hydropower dams with funding, marketing support, lacks oversight and environmental assessments that are superficial window dressing. Most of the dams Hydro-Quebec uses today were built with no environmental study at all. This hydropower development is done by the state's government state-owned monopolies. The profits are paid to the government of the province. These revenues are generated off stolen lands where indigenous communities live in what they describe as third world conditions, lacking running water and impoverished, while Hydro-Quebec, Manitoba Hydro, and the other colonial powers in Canada sell stolen electricity to U.S. consumers who call it green energy. This is environmental racism and an economic and social injustice. The three financial boondoggles commonly being talked about today in Canada are the big mega dams being built for export to the US. Muskrat Falls, 824 megawatts, expected cost to complete over $3 billion plus transmission. Manitoba's Kiosk Dam, $8.7 billion with a quarter at $4.6 billion. The Site C Dam at 12 billion and you can jump to the next slide and see these quarters. There you go. Oops. Um, <clears throat> these new dams are being built and more are planned. The Canadian government is planning to build 60 more uh, developed 60% more of the hydro capacity across the country. At a time when only one third of the world's rivers are free flowing, one million species are at risk for extinction, and Canada's forests and river systems are some of the most important carbon sinks on the planet, the Canadian government intends to further marginalize and impoverish indigenous communities and export this electricity as green. Indigenous communities are rising up. In one case, the Innu of Labrador in October 2020 sent Hydro-Quebec a message saying you owe us $4 billion for the electricity stolen from our lands that you plan to export over CMP. And the bill is 50 years past due, 50 years ago, the largest dam that is part of, uh, one of the largest dams that is part of Hydro-Quebec's uh, fleet was built on stolen Inu of Labrador dams. That's the Upper Churchill Falls and the Smallwood Reservoir. 
by First Nations in Quebec in October 2020 sent a similar message to Hydro-Quebec that the CMP corridor is selling stolen goods for profits to be made by Avangrid, Iberdroller, Hydro-Quebec, and CMP. The NECAC, or New England Clean Energy Connect project, is a shameful project. It is environmental racism and the height of hypocrisy by Governor Baker and his administration in Massachusetts and Governor Mills who purport to value economic and climate justice. Please help us stop this project and get in touch with me for more information. Thanks. Thank you, Meg. Um, I, uh, I hope you will, if you have any questions for Meg, you can put them in the chat. And um, now I would like to introduce Mark Presswick. Um, Mark, can you introduce yourself? Happily, Becky, thank you. Um, uh, I am the deputy director uh, for the Sierra Club um, in the Northeast. So I support the Sierra Club's work on energy and climate from uh, West Virginia, Virginia up to Maine. Um, as well as co-managing our building electrification work nationally. Um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time very briefly because I'd really like to get into Q&A. Um, so feel free to ask as many questions as you want um, through the chat function um, or at the conclusion of um, uh, Kevin's uh, talk in just a moment. Um, just thank you to Meg, um, the main chapter and everyone who has worked so hard for so many decades um, to oppose the uh, kind of egregious false claims and destruction um, that Hydro-Quebec and other um, crown corporations uh, in Canada have uh, devastated um, the uh, consumers, communities, uh, the environment over uh, the many, many years that they have uh, developed these uh, massive mega dams. For us um, here in the United States, um, in the Northeast, um, one of the worst impacts um, beyond everything Meg talked about, which is absolutely um, right, um, is the fact that uh, Hydro-Quebec and the, some of these other um, companies are asking and getting uh, decision makers, state officials in, and city officials in the Northeast to require customers to pay higher electricity prices, to pay more money than they would otherwise pay in order to subsidize these destructive activities and to send money from uh, our customers, from our, uh, through our electricity bills up to Canada to pay for this destruction and these devastating impacts. Um, they do this under the guise and of the claims of some kind of benefit to uh, New England and New York Northeast customers. The facts are simply not there to support those claims. Um, the uh, most egregious approval so far is the approval of uh, contracts in Massachusetts for Massachusetts ratepayers uh, to pay for both the New England Clean Energy Connect project um, as well as um, subsidize, again, the existing dams, the dams that have already been built, that are already operating um, and already providing power. Uh, the simple question is what on earth uh, why would Massachusetts officials uh, fund and, and or approve these egregious contracts, particularly when they don't require Hydro-Quebec to even provide more electricity uh, than they are currently providing into the region. Um, so customers in Massachusetts are getting absolutely nothing for these egregious contracts that have been approved. And New the city of New York is considering exactly the same arrangement. Hydro-Quebec has stated in public official filings that they oppose setting a baseline based on uh, for the amount of electricity sales that they are currently selling into New York and would be required to sell above that baseline, to sell more power. Um, and Hydro-Quebec opposes that. They want subsidies from our customers in order to pay uh, for uh, things they're already doing and already um, uh, again, already providing into the region. Um, in the impact of that is to suppress um, wind and solar, the kind of clean energy resources that actually create jobs 
here in the region that uh, particularly offshore wind that provides uh, coastal communities with a future, solar um, that can be distributed and cited in many different parts of the system, creating jobs and tax revenues in rural areas and throughout the region, as well as onshore wind, um, energy efficiency, the kind of resources that actually reduce climate pollution, that create jobs, that spur revenues and tax base. That is, those are the sorts of uh, investments that customers in the Northeast could be supporting instead of shipping their money out of the country um, due to intense uh, lobbying campaigns, money that's poured in um, by Hydro-Quebec and Crown Corporations into um, the political discussions um, in the region. Um, it's just uh, particularly in Maine, you know, where um, uh, these, some of these foreign uh, companies own the electric system that have poured millions of dollars into advertisements and lobbying against uh, communities that are standing up for their rights to protect the environment. The New England Clean Energy Connect, uh, where communities are standing up to say, no, we don't want this transmission line uh, for uh, costly, expensive, destructive Canadian hydro to come through our communities to um, harm our communities, uh, are just swamped by the millions of dollars that Hydro-Quebec and some of these other companies pour into um, lobbying uh, and public relations. Um, it just it is a deeply troubling um, situation and Sierra Club um, has been fighting uh, these contracts uh, through from a state uh, as they've moved through discussions with state officials and ultimately approvals. Um, we've also been organizing um, and supporting the work to uh, stop the New England Clean Energy Connect transmission line. Um, Kevin's going to talk about some of the specifics that are coming up um, with the Army Corps so I'll turn it over to him in just a moment but I just want to um, uh, kind of read a particular call for action for anyone on this webinar. Um, Again, the Massachusetts situation is kind of already gone, but New York is really the place where uh, the next, where Hydro-Quebec and uh, Canadian companies are really trying hard um, to secure these kind of out-of-market subsidies for their dirty, dangerous, destructive products um, and kind of making the same outrageous um, uh, claims. So really want to encourage you all to focus on New York uh, to convince decision makers there, particularly in the city of New York, um, to support uh, wind, and solar and long-term contracts for uh, the kind of resources that actually reduce climate pollution, that um, create new jobs, keep money in the community, um, and don't destroy uh, communities, the environment. So just really want to encourage you all to um, speak up to New York state officials, New York city officials, um, and uh, really see if we can um, get that stopped. Again, Massachusetts kind of already moved on. The last gasp uh, Kevin's going to talk about um, so that's where I'll leave it um, and pass it back to Becky to introduce Kevin. Thank you very much. I look forward to answering any of your questions in the chat. Thanks, Mark. Um, that was great. Uh, and um, so then I want to now introduce you to Kevin Cassidy. Um, Kevin, I again, will you introduce yourself and please um, feel free to put some questions in the chat. Thanks a lot, Becky. Uh, my name is Kevin Cassidy. I'm an environmental lawyer with the Earthrise Law Center, uh, which is the environmental legal clinic of Lewis and Clark Law School, uh, <clears throat> which is located in Portland, Oregon. Uh, but I am uh, myself based in Massachusetts and um, really appreciative of getting the opportunity to come here. Thanks for the invitation tonight and especially on a, uh, on a program to honor, you know, Boyce Richardson. I just bought his book, uh, Strangers Devour the Land. I haven't read it yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Um, you know, I'm one of the newbies, I guess, to uh, some of the, the <clears throat> dam resistance that's been going on. Probably one of the naive guys who thought uh, we really can't be still building these kinds of dams in North America in the <laughs> 21st century, can we? And um, turns out, Yes, they are. And, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> I guess about three years ago, uh, you know, Meg called me up because uh, she heard about some rumor about some undersea uh, line going down to the Pilgrim Nuclear Power, power Plant, which Meg has been uh, opposing since she was, you know, uh, in elementary school, I think. And uh, so anything having to do with Pilgrim, she was... Uh, uh, she was interested in, and um, I've, I've watched her 
build this amazing coalition, uh, NAMRA, you know, really from the ground up since then have been able to work um, uh, with NAMRA and then through that um, got to, to meet the folks in the main Sierra Club chapter, you know, Becky and Joan and, and um, has been fantastic working with them. Um, so, so thanks, thanks a lot to the chapter for having me tonight. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, as Mark said, there's a, uh, you know, there's a lot of opposition to the CMP transmission line, which is also the NECAC. You'll, you'll probably hear it referred to as, as a couple different uh, acronyms uh, that's going through Maine uh, that's going to deliver this electricity to Massachusetts. Um, and there's, you know, tons of opposition to this project up in Maine, and there's been a lot of uh, challenges to it, legal challenges at the state administrative level. Uh, there was a uh, more than 80,000 signatures gathered uh, to put it on a, on a referendum for the uh, for the ballot uh, in the election next week that was struck down by the Supreme Court, Maine Supreme Court. And as, as Mark said, one of the sort of final hurdles that the, the project needs to get over um, is the federal permitting process. Uh, and that's what I'm gonna talk about. And I'll just say at the outset, um, I do represent the Sierra Club. Uh, I am their lawyer, so there, there, there may be, um, uh, in terms of the Q&A, there may be some client confidentiality issues that I may not be able to answer questions, not because I don't want to, it's because I need to, um, you know, protect the confidentiality of the client, um, the Sierra Club. But um, so the outstanding federal permits right now um, for this for this transmission line coming in through Maine, which is, is going to be about 145 miles uh, of line coming from the Canadian border um, through the western Maine mountains, uh, cutting across the very southern edge of the of the Maine North Woods. Um, really, the first the first 53 miles, which is which is segment one of the project, is through relatively undeveloped forest land. Um, really beautiful area. It's going to impact a lot of. Uh, wetlands, aquatic resources, vernal pools, um, stream, a lot, of, you know, numerous stream and river crossings. Uh, they're going to have, they're going to deforest, you know, a, a lot of areas that currently have um, uh, a lot of forest cover, which is going to impact the native brook trout in the area. That's, that's one of the really last strongholds for native brook trout on the east, in the eastern United States. Um, you have uh, federal and uh, in, in threatened and endangered species in the area, Canada lynx, Atlantic salmon. Um, it's, it's really, this area is at the heart of a uh, really globally significant um, uh, bio, you know, area of biodiversity. Uh, and uh, this, this is gonna instantly become one of the largest fragmenting features in the area. So there's a lot of, environmental harm just in Maine alone, not, you know, even mentioning or not even thinking about the, the harm that Meg was speaking and Meg and Mark were speaking about in terms of uh, the dams themselves up in Canada and, you know, the indigenous communities up there. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in order to uh, run the line through that area of Maine, because there's going to be impacts to aquatic resources, uh, the, the CMP needs a Clean Water Act permit. Uh, it's also known as a 404, Section 404 permit, uh, because they're going to be filling some wetlands, uh, impacting some other, uh, you know, waters of the United States. And they applied for that permit back in 2017. Um, they also need a uh, presidential permit, what's called the presidential permit from the uh, Department of Energy. Um, and uh, that's because they're crossing an international border. Uh, and both of those permits have not yet been issued. Uh, as part of 
both issuing both of those permits, both the Army Corps of Engineers, which is responsible for the Clean Water Act permit, and the Department of Energy, which is responsible for the presidential permit, need to comply with the National Environmental Policy Act, or otherwise known as NEPA. Um, and this is, this is really, this, this statute passed in 1969, it's one of the keystone environmental statutes in this country uh, that requires federal agencies when they're uh, taking an action um, to determine whether or not it's gonna have a significant uh, impact on the environment. And so for the last uh, two or three years, uh, the Corps and DOE have been uh, going through this process with CMP, largely, uh, you know, behind closed doors. Uh, there's not a lot of this process that has been really open to the public, which is one of the problems we have with this. You know, NEPA really requires that the agencies seek out and involve the public as much as possible through commenting and public hearings and um, their environmental analysis. Uh, and, and the core and DOE really uh, haven't done that up to this point at all. Uh, there was a public comment process uh, in March uh, of 2019. Uh, so we did submit some comments on, on behalf of the Sierra Club. Uh, we asked them to have a public hearing. They refused. Eventually, uh, one of the congressional de uh, delegation from Maine uh, asked uh, the uh, Corps to have a public hearing, and they uh, did so in December of 2019. Uh, and that's, that's, that's really it. And, and even the public notice that they put out in March, uh, EPA, uh, which has joint jurisdiction over the Clean Water Act permit, told the Corps uh, that its public notice was deficient, it should, it should reissue it, it didn't have enough information, and that it also should put its draft environmental documents up on, on their website, uh, none of which the Corps uh, decided to do. Um, so uh, we, NEPA, uh, when an agency is uh, analyzing a project under NEPA, they can go basically in two directions. They can go and do an environmental assessment and decide there's not a significant impact. And uh, then they issue what's called a finding of no significant impact, F-O-N-S-I, so a FONSI. They, if, they, if they find there's a significant impact, uh, then they have to go to a next step, uh, which is a more robust environmental analysis and involves more public participation, uh, which is important. Uh, and that's called an environmental impact statement or an EIS. Um, the core, as we've come to learn, doesn't like to do EISs uh, in Maine. Uh, apparently they haven't done one for any federal project in Maine for at least the last 10 years. Uh, and they didn't wanna do one for this project either. Uh, so they started with an EA and the environmental assessment and they um, have continued along that path. Uh, and <clears throat> we, <laughs> what, you know, you all may be familiar with the Freedom of Information Act, also uh, another statute, federal statute, that allows you to see, ask federal agencies for documents, uh, which they then have an obligation to turn over to you. We started asking the Corps on behalf of the Sierra Club in January under the Freedom of Information Act for documents. And they would, they would provide them, and then, but, we, but then the cutoff date would happen, so we'd have to ask them again. And we, we've done four FOIA requests with the Corps since January. And in the last one, um, uh, we received from the Corps their final environmental assessment and finding of no significant impact, which was dated July 7th of 2020, uh, which they did and signed and authorized uh, completely internally and uh, as far as we know, uh, and I've looked, uh, it's never shown up on their website. They never published it. They never put it out for public comment. They just signed it and then continued to uh, negotiate on the Clean Water Act permit uh, that they still need to finalize. So, um, so they're right now, you know, as it stands, there's no EIS uh, and the Corps is not planning on doing one uh, because they've already made a finding of no significant impact. I, I, I mean, it sound, even as I say it for a project like this, it sounds absurd. Um, this is a you know 100 and 
45 mile transmission corridor that's going to have um, major impacts to the natural resources environment um, in Maine. Uh, and yet the Corps uh, decided that they uh, didn't need to do an EIS, uh, didn't need any more public participation. And um, that's, you know, that's where it stands. Now with DOE, so now we're waiting, you know, waiting around for the Corps to issue the Clean Water Act permit, uh, which once the Corps does that, then, then the Corps' you know, federal business is over. With DOE, um, they took a slightly different tact and have said publicly, they, in a letter to Senator Susan Collins, that they were going to uh, issue their environmental assessment for public comment. Um, that, is, that has not happened yet. Uh, and so we're waiting for DOE to put out that so you know, we can see what they have to say and comment on it. One of the things that came out of the Corps' environmental analysis uh, was that DOE apparently had done an internal report or study about the greenhouse gas uh, emissions impacts uh, from this this project, and they had concluded that uh, there would you know there would be uh, that it, the project would be beneficial for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know we haven't seen that report yet. We haven't seen that document. Obviously, we haven't vetted it. And we don't know what it says, but. Um, uh, it's referenced in the Corps' environmental assessment, and uh, the Corps apparently is relying on it too. So um, once you know, we'll see where this goes. Once these, once the uh, uh, Clean Water Act permit is issued, once the presidential permit is issued, essentially that'll be the end of the federal process, and um, we'll have to examine those those permits and and the environmental analysis and see. Uh, what options there are uh, for the Sierra Club. Um, so I, I think I'll, I, I'll leave it there and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. I see I'm using a lot of acronyms. That's always uh, a danger with an environmental lawyer. Um, so, you know, it, uh, you know, if anyone who wants to ask any, ask me any questions, uh, you know, I'd be happy to, uh, spell out an acronym or follow up on anything. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mar uh, Kevin. Um, I, the, we have a couple of questions so far. Um, one of them is, um, and I think you mostly answered it from Carrie New uh, Niederma Niederman. Um, um, she asks, uh, somebody went somewhere else. Um, she asks, you know, uh, how can they use the name New England Clean Energy and and what regulations do they uh, do they have to be accountable for? Um, I think um, they this, answering that question for Maine. They have gone through the DEP Department of Environmental Protection process, um, but uh, but really what we're looking at is the the last permit that is needed or the last two permits, um, and one is from the Department of Energy DOE. Um, and maybe you want to just mention something about that, Kevin, about, or not, did you, yeah. About, about the, the uh, the presidential permit? Yeah, just that we're, well, or the fact that, uh, I guess, filing a lawsuit uh, to, to, we have filed a lawsuit against the Department of Energy. Uh, we have, no, we haven't. No. Oh, 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 no, oh, there's no, there's no lawsuit because the Department of Energy has not filed, has not. Oh, I'm sorry, you're talking about the FOIA lawsuit. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, separate lawsuit. Um, the Department of Energy has not filed their presidential permit yet for the project, but they, but unlike the Corps, the Department of Energy, when we sent them a Freedom of Information Act request, they never, they never really responded, uh, and that's unfortunately typical of a lot of federal agencies these days. Um, they're either delaying or not responding to Freedom of Information Act requests. And that's one of the reasons we don't have that report from DOE. So Becky's right, last, last Friday, um, uh, or actually two Fridays ago, we filed a uh, federal lawsuit in Maine against the Department of Energy to force them to uh, turn over the the documents that we had requested back in January. 
So that's in process right now. So uh, then um, there's another question uh, from Catherine Skopik. Is there going to be a new EIS? Yeah, I mean, unless a court ultimately tells the core or DO or the Department of Energy to do one, uh, probably the answer is no. The core is not going to do one on its own. They've already finished their environmental analysis with an environmental assessment and a, and a finding of no significant impact that, that, they, that they finalized in July. Um, so as far as they're concerned, they're done. In fact, you know, they wrote a letter, uh, the Penobscot Nation uh, asked the Corps, among other, many other groups and individuals were asking the Corps to do an environmental impact statement. And, and I should say, I mean, the reason, the reason environmental impact statement is important is because it's, it's, it's more detailed analysis and there's a lot more opportunity for public comment and public vetting of what the Corps is doing. Most of what the Corps did in terms of its analysis for this so far has been done with CMP and out, outside the public view. So with an environmental impact statement, they have to put the draft impact statement out for public comment they're required to. Um, here they weren't re necessarily required to do it, although we think they should have. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's the importance of that, you know, one of the important things about that distinction. Um, but, it, but the court doesn't like to do them in Maine, and unless they, uh, I think, get told by a court, they're probably not going to do it. Um, I, thank you. Um, I think this question might be for Meg. Um, how can companies get away with manipulating local and national policies and laws so that those especially diverse and indigenous peoples who are actually living at the source of the energy project are not considered in the decision-making process of approving such a project? Is this a question for me? I, I think so. Um, oh, okay. Um, well, Kevin can answer that too, but I will just say that, um, you know, after studying the record uh, for the Champlain Hudson Power Express in New York and knowing what I know about the Vermont, Vermont line and CMP, no federal agency or state agency has ever looked at the impacts of hydro dams and greenhouse gas impacts in Canada. They simply say it's beyond the border and beyond our jurisdiction. But I know Kevin has talked about that in some of his comments and maybe you can elaborate on why you think that should no longer be the position of the agencies. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a hard one, Meg. I mean, I think the court, the court, the case law, um, you know, we have, unfortunately, um, we, humans create these borders um, and that, and the border, you know, of course, uh, climate change, greenhouse gas emissions um, and, and impacts from transmission corridors like this don't, don't ne necessarily uh, recognize borders. Um, so there is a lot that, you know, makes it difficult to uh, raise extraterritorial impacts from, you know, uh, from uh, projects that are happening in the United States. Um, you know, we think that, you know, we, we submitted comments on behalf of the Sierra Club that raise these issues. And we think, you know, in terms of environmental justice, and simply, you know, the idea that this project, it's, it's all connected. It's one large project that stretches down from those dams to, um, to the transmission corridor into Maine and into Massachusetts. Without the dams, there's no electricity. Uh, that, that, you know, is something that um, the federal agencies should be taking into account. Um, legally, it, it, it's a tough argument. Um, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so Roger Wheeler asks, the Conservation Law Foundation is very involved in improving NECAC. Why? Uh, 
And that's, that's definitely for me. Uh, sorry, and <laughs> uh, we can't speak. I have to say, we cannot speak for why the Conservation Law Foundation is involved and why they chose to have a different position uh, in Maine than they had in New Hampshire. Uh, we have certainly asked them. Maybe Meg, you would like to mention your meetings with them. I don't know. Sure. Um, Along with our indigenous allies um, from Canada, we have met with Conservation Law Foundation's president and talked to them and explained um, the impacts of the dams, uh, the climate justice issues. Of course, CLF is uh, very into environmental justice and environmental racism. And we explained how this is you know, morally wrong and it is environmental racism not to consider these impacts in Canada in their policy making and in their policies that support Canadian hydro and imports of Canadian hydro, even while acknowledging, as they do, as CLF does, that the fossil fuel imp uh, the climate impacts of Canadian hydro dams are on par with fossil fuels, specifically natural gas. So there are a lot of um, discrepancies there in addition to them not um, supporting and, and fighting very hard against this very same hydro dam corridor in New Hampshire, the Northern Pass, but then supporting the same exact basically project in um, Maine, not to discount that there are differences in the on the ground impacts in Maine and Vermont and New Hampshire but the impacts on the frontline communities and the indigenous communities in Canada are the same. So we are urging them to take a second look at this and um, hopefully they will perhaps um, come to a different conclusion. That's my wishful thinking. Thank you. Um... There's a question, uh, is there any way to challenge the course finding that there is no significant impact, the FONSI finding? Uh, sure, I could take that. Um, there is, uh, it would involve um, uh, filing a lawsuit uh, in federal court uh, and raising the, you know, the claim that the the finding uh, is essentially arbitrary and capricious uh, and not supported by the evidence. So, um, you know, the, there, there is an avenue um, and that's probably as much as I can say about that on this Zoom call. Thank you. Um, so then um, I think Catherine Skopik asks, um, uh, New, what about their new protected habitat area for Atlantic sturgeon? Did not this cause new reasons for an updated EIS? I don't know about that. Um, do you know about that, Kevin or Mark or anybody? I, you know, I don't. Uh, I, I didn't. Uh, they did do, as they did, the Corps did as part of their um, environmental analysis they there was an es uh, endangered species act consultation with the fish and wildlife service uh, they identified um, atlantic salmon uh, canada lynx the northern long-eared bat and a and a uh, species an orchid species of plant that were listed as threatened or endangered and that would be within the project area so um, the sturgeon were not uh, considered, and I don't, I don't know of any uh, critical habitat for sturgeon uh, in, in the area where the project is gonna be. Yeah, this is, this is Meg. I think Catherine's probably referring to the sturgeon habitat in the Hudson River. Okay. So, um, Maybe Mark. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Well, okay, so, um, the similar project to the CMP corridor is the Champlain Hudson Power Express, as we mentioned, 330 miles from the Canadian border to Queens, New York, or Astoria, New York. Um, 
and half, 50, I believe about 50 miles of that goes under the Hudson River. A large portion also goes under the Sh Lake Champlain, but the EIS for that was approved in approximately 2012. And since that time, the National Marine Fisheries Service, a federal agency designated new habitat for the endanger an endangered population of sturgeon in the Hudson River. So the Center for Biological Diversity, NAMRA, North American Megadam Resistance Alliance, and the Innu Nation of Labrador filed what is called a notice of violation letter in October or perhaps late September of 2020 um, with the Department of Energy and the Army Corps of Engineers requiring them in New York to go back and look at that endangered uh, salmon habitat in the river and to assess the impacts of the buried cable under the river on this newly designated habitat. So um, that's a notice of violation letter. The next step on that is for the federal agencies to respond to us, to tell us whether they are willing to do a new study of the habitat. And if they don't, then we have the option of pursuing legal means in court. But I don't believe that there, there is any similar opportunity in Maine because again, this was a specific situation where new habitat was designated since the EIS was done. And it's interesting to note as well that a full environmental impact statement was done in New York for that corridor, but the same exact same federal agencies in Maine are refusing to do a full environmental impact statement. Yeah, same for the corridor in New Hampshire. They did an EIS, so environmental impact statement. There is a question. Um, I'm not exactly sure what it means. Is there something between Sierra Club Maine and in Canada? Um, just to mention that we are working with the Sierra Club Canada on um, uh, on uh, uh, fighting um, hydro uh, hydro Quebec and other mega dams. But Mark, I don't know if you would like to talk a little bit about Sierra Club's national policy vis-a-vis um, -vis hydro dams. Um. I mean, I think the Sierra Club's national policy uh, for many decades now um, has largely opposed massive um, mega dams like this. We've worked very hard to, um, with a number of other partners, to uh, see some of these mega dams retired uh, and taken down in various parts of the country. Um, at the same time, you know, run of the river hydro, um, where you're not a massive mega dam is something that uh, we generally support. So it just really gets to the, these mega dams have massive impacts that we oppose, whereas um, it is possible to develop um, low impact um, run of the river hydro that doesn't have these same impacts and still gets the benefits. So that's definitely something that um, we navigate. But again, our focus is on getting wind and solar truly clean renewable resources ramped up as quickly as possible. And we spend a lot of time and resources um, making that happen across the country. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'm not sure if that answered your question. This is Catherine again, Catherine Skopik. Do you want to um, unmute yourself and ask your question if that was not what you were asking? I'm very happy to know that uh, n that this is national's policy. I had heard that, so it's good to have it confirmed. And thank you, Becky. Uh, I was just wondering, since this is so much a Canadian uh, problem as well as the United States problem, if there is working together with the Canadian uh, Sierra Club as well as say Maine or any any other of the Sierra Club groups to kind of pool our resources and work together on this problem. That's really what that question was after. And thank you, Meg, so much for going into that great detail on the Atlantic sturgeon uh, endangered habitat. I, I appreciate that very much, uh, Meg. Welcome. Yeah. So the question is the Canadian Sierra Club that I know very little about how it functions, is it the same in Canada as here, and do we work together on this problem? Uh, yes, we do work together on this problem. We have met with, um, we are meeting with um, Gretchen 
Uh, Fitzgerald, have, she's come to many of our meetings. Um, they, of course, have a serious problem in New Brunswick with coal, um, but we are working with them. Uh, they are not as extensive. Um, and I don't believe there are chapters in every, um, maybe there province. are chapters in every province, but I don't know. Um, there certainly is, a, 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 maybe Joan, do you know more about, I know you're on here. Um, could you mention something about Canadian Sierra Club, Sierra Club Canada. Can you unmute yourself, John? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, we have been talking with, uh, with Gretchen Fitzgerald. They are very concerned. They have, and she's in Nova Scotia, and um, Nova Scotia has a lot of coal-fired power plants, and of course, we know we have this campaign in the U.S. beyond coal, Mark's been working on that for a long time. So um, we're very concerned about um, something new that's come up about called the Atlantic Loop. We're not sure exactly what the um, Canadians want to do with that, but whenever you talk about um, transmission lines and connecting things, we always think that it'll pro probably impact Maine and also, you know, the USA is uh, the recipient of their power. So we're working with her uh, on that and uh, worried about the possibility that more um, energy coming from Canada will impact and become a prob probable cause to build a new dam in Labrador, Gulf Island dam. So. We're just starting to uh, work closely with them on on a campaign to uh, bring that uh, awareness to the public, including here in Maine and in the U.S. And Meg could probably add something to that if she wants. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, do you do you want to add something, Meg, uh, to that? Sure. Um, just that, um, as I mentioned, the Canadian government has stated under oath in the proceedings before the International Trade Commission this past summer that they plan to develop 60% more hydro capacity, they call it. They don't call these river systems, they don't call them rivers, and they don't call them people's uh, ancestral lands. They call them uh, hydro capacity. So they clearly have a plan. They're going ahead with the three mega dams that I mentioned. You can hear a lot, a lot more about that on NAMRA's webinar that we did on October 14th about the Site C Dam and Sarah Cox, the uh, award-winning author of Reaching the Peace, was on that webinar and she explained the situation in Canada very well. She's a reporter with the Canadian outlet, the Narwhal. But as um, many know, the first part of the Lower Churchill Falls hydro dam complex that the Crown Corporation, Nalcor Energy, that's Newfoundland and Labrador Corporation, um, completed in 2019 is the Muskrat Falls Dam. The second part of that is Gull Island and the Canadian government has uh, signaled that it, there is an intent to develop that dam. It would be three times the size of Muskrat Falls at around 2,200 megawatts. It would completely obliterate um, Gull Island that is used and has been used for millennia by indigenous communities for annual gatherings, as well as releasing far more methylmercury into the river systems and um, flooding more indigenous lands. So we are concerned about what's going on in Canada and um, very concerned about some of the reports coming out of the government and even some NGOs about decarbonization pathways in Canada and how hydro fits into that. Thank you. Thanks, Meg. Um, there's a, another question that has to do with could this be taken to the United Nations and given, uh, given it's across a border and uh, does the United Nations, what does the United Nations say about hydropower? Uh, 
we know recently, I think today, I we received some information about the EU. Do you want to mention that, Meg? Um, or was it Ju uh, Julian who sent it, that the EU is considering um, uh, disallowing hydropower as part of their uh, renewable portfolio standard? Um, well, there was a sign-on letter from 150 groups in um, Europe uh, opposing um, hydro dams, even small hydro dams across Europe. Um, as to the UN, there have been at least two that I know of petitions to the UN under the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People or UNDRIP involving Canadian mega dams. There was one that was brought to the Special Rapporteur on Toxins in 2019 or 2018, I believe, by a community from Labrador. And that involved the methylmercury poisoning of indigenous foods by Canadian hydro dams, in particular Muskrat Falls, that would make that uh, methylmercury poisoning worse. I'll just just to briefly talk about it um, and the UN and why it went to the UN. So methylmercury is produced when the mercury in organic materials is flooded by dams. It converts into a neuro neurotoxin that enters into the food supply that is relied on by indigenous communities in remote locations. And this has been going on since these dams were first uh, constructed and flooded forests in the 1960s and 70s. So indigenous communities in Canada have a, already have higher levels of methylmercury in their bloodstreams. Hydro-Quebec has never done a full um, uh, epidemiological study. The idea is, to, is according to Hydro-Quebec, that the indigenous communities should just not, uh, not eat the, the foods they should refrain from eating too much of the fish that's contaminated with methylmercury. So that led to the petition to UNDRIP from the communities in Labrador. There was a Harvard study that showed that the new dams in Labrador would cause increased levels of methylmercury poisoning in indigenous communities. And there was also an UNDRIP petition involving indigenous rights with the Site C mega dam that's being built by BC Hydro in British Columbia. Sorry, um, thank you very much. Um, there's obviously a lot happening worldwide. There's, you know, of course, um, indigenous people are being hurt all over the world um, uh, by these uh, high mega dams. So it's, you know, it's an international problem. Um, so the next question from Julia St. Clair, is there any gov government agency or certain officials that could pressure Army Corps to complete, to complete an EIS for NECAC at this point? Um, and um, so uh, I, um, maybe I'll throw this to Kevin. Um, I yeah, sure. Um, uh, unlikely. Uh, you know, they're, they've, they've been uh, received some pressure from, as I said, some of the congressional delegation in Maine um, has, has specifically requested it, uh, and they haven't taken them up on it. Um, the EPA has sort of largely remained on the sidelines, unfortunately. I think they, they could have played a larger role here and, and put some more pressure on the core to do an EIS, I think that's what EPA, I think if you, uh, you know, got EPA in a room uh, without the politicians, uh, some, of the, some of the career people, they probably would say they think uh, an EIS was appropriate here, but, um, but I think, you know, not at this point, it's either, uh, it's gonna probably have to be a uh, federal judge if it's going to be anyone to, to, to make them do it. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, it, it's, it's unfortunate that you don't, that the interagency review team, you know, the information from all of these 
uh, at various agencies is kind of uh, behind closed doors. So it's, you know, you have to do a FOIA to see what they've done. But we do know that the EPA did um, suggest to the um, Army Corps that they ought to do an EIS, correct? They, uh, well, I, I wouldn't, I'm not sure I would say that, Becky. I, I think they, in their letter to the Corps, you know, they said their, their public comment was deficient. They should put it out, you know, they, they should be more transparent. They should put all their, their environmental assessment on, um, on their website. Uh, you know, put the documents up so people can see what the Corps is, is talking about and analyzing. Um, but, uh, um, and I, th you know, but I'm not sure EPA is, certainly publicly, they haven't come out as, as far as I know and, and asked the, and told the Corps they should do an EIS. Great, thanks. Um, are there any further questions um, of anyone? I don't see any more directly in the chat. Um, um, Becky, did we answer Gilbert's question? Oh, did I did I miss one? Um, oh, you want, to, you want to know if a new administration will make? Oh it gosh, different. I didn't see that. Right. Yes. Why don't you take that one, Mark? <laughs> um, I think right now most of the uh, the real question is. Um, uh, if their new administration comes in, you know, assuming all the permits have already been issued, can they kind of remand, voluntarily remand? So that's probably a question to Kevin. I don't know that they would um, voluntary remand, even with a new administration, um, but uh, happy to let Kevin speak to that if he wants. I think it's probably an uphill lift given kind of where some of the different states are at. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with Mark. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, uh, hydro like this probably falls into some, you know, uh, I mean, we got, you know, the vice president saying he's not going to ban fracking in Pennsylvania, which I think, you know, he feels like he has to say right now to, to, to win that state. But, um, you know, fracking is, is, you know, is, I think even seeing is even more, you know, at least viewed as more, more of a problem for, for, you know, emissions than, than hydro is certainly. And, and so I think, you know, there's, there is a lot of misinformation out there about the impacts of especially these mega dams and especially their greenhouse gas emissions impacts. And until some of that gets, you know, really, straightened out and you know people become more aware through some of the work that the sierra club and NAMR are doing um uh, i think that's helping a lot um it, it's it's going to be it's going to be hard for an, even a new administration to walk away from some hydro but um i think you know i think technically they could do it i mean i think that you know you've seen sort of the back and forth with the core up in pebble mine in uh in Alaska when the administration's changed. So it's certainly the new administration's prerogative to be able to relook at, 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 some, at some of the actions the previous administration has taken. Thank you. Uh, let's see, um, Meg is uh, asking, can you comment, Canada, on the claim of the Inu against Hydro Quebec and the comments of the five First Nations to DOE, Department of Energy, on CMP? Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not sure, Meg. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I've seen those and, and certainly the comments to, 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 to DOE, um, you know, they're, they're still very much in the environmental assessment process and and thankfully they're going to put out their you know if they stay true to what they said they're going to put out their environmental assessment for public comment so just I, I would say this is a call to action I guess for folks on this on this call when that happens you know it's going to be there's going to be 30 days um, when DOE puts out that environmental assessment uh, for folks to comment on it uh, that's that's the the one that's related to the presidential permit, and so really important to you know make those comments, get them in, get as many people uh, commenting on that as possible. Uh, really digging into some of their analysis, 
and and see it if you know if it if it holds up. So that's um, you know, uh, and I think you know the 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 First Nations and the and even you know and some of the uh, uh, tribes in in Maine, uh, you know they they there's some real compelling testimony uh, that they've been giving and that they continue to give about the impacts of these uh, these dams and hopefully hopefully the agencies will, will start to listen to it. Uh, there's a question for Meg. Um, do you know the status of um, in New York City with de Blasio wanting to sign on with HQ Hydro, Hydro Quebec quickly or very soon? Um, yes, I saw a recent quote in the press by Sophie Bouchot, um, president and CEO of Hydro Quebec saying that she is quote unquote hopeful and hopes that there will be a deal signed within the next two months. So as Mark mentioned, it really is urgent that folks um, do as much as they can to, to pressure the city not to sign that contract and to um, try to stop the, C the uh, Champlain Hudson Power Express we also were quite dismayed, although we're still looking into it, to see that the city of New York's climate office was um, very supportive of the tier four RECs, our renewable energy credit subsidies for hydropower. It's unclear to me whether Hydro Quebec's electricity would qualify for that subsidies. I think there are some hoops there that they have to jump through that they might not be able to do. And I feel like those subsidies were seeming to favor in-state hydropower and in-state renewables. But I feel that that is all part of the political maneuverings by Hydro-Quebec, by the Quebec government, by the governors and premiers, lobbying and um, Hydro-Quebec's lobbyists and the Quebec government's lobby lobbyists, obviously, with Governor Cuomo, with Mayor de Blasio, trying to get that contract signed before there's a new administration. I think maybe when Sophie Brochot mentioned that, she was thinking uh, you know, about an election, the mayoral elections in New York City. So, um, you know, the next few months are critical in terms of that contract as well. Um, so and we know there's a lot of behind the scenes maneuvering going on there. It's a significant amount of money that the Canadian Crown is putting towards um, advocating for their own benefit. Uh, and, you know, which I think is, is pretty disgusting actually you know that they are spending so much money in maine and in new york and um i think it's got to be you know in, in all of our communities we need to be talking a little taking some action about how much money is being spent to try to tip the balance towards you know canadian hydro instead of you know local resources yeah absolutely becky if i could just uh, this is mark yeah. um yeah speak to that for a moment i think one of the most important things to highlight uh with new york city decision makers in particular um, is the fact that Hydro-Quebec is on record opposing selling more power, in, being required to sell more power into New York than they're currently selling, right? They're asking to be paid by New York City ratepayers more money for absolutely nothing. Um, I know there was, I had a private chat um, uh, earlier um, on this thread highlighting, you know, a council member in New York City saying, oh, well, you know, how else are we going to replace Indian Point? This has nothing to do with Indian Point nuclear plant, right? Indian Point's going to shut down next year. The plan to replace Indian Point is well underway. There's no possibility of providing any power pursuant to these contracts, even if they were required uh, to sell additional power um, uh, prior to that point. So it's just, the, there's a lot of misinformation being thrown around in New York City on these topics that really uh, cutting through that chase is very important. And, and Becky, if you don't mind, I, I'm happy to jump to Andy's question too. I answered in the chat. Yeah, well. It'd be great if you want to jump to that and then I might say something about it as well. Yeah, absolutely. So Andy had asked, you know, are we supporting local micro districts for uh, solar and wind? Absolutely. Um, it's definitely something we're putting as much resources as we can into um, to advance. And then frankly, uh, you know, our points in Massachusetts on these contracts was you should be contracting with wind and solar. Uh, and there were thousands of megawatts 
um, of wind and solar projects that bid into the exact same request for proposals uh, that um, ultimately the contracts were awarded to uh, the Canadian hydro projects, which is just to me um, just so horrendous, right? And that the actual projects and that the um, contracts for NECEC, the transmission line from Maine and Hydro-Quebec weren't even the highest ranked. They weren't the cheapest. They didn't have the most benefits. Um, it's just really um, a horrible situation where there were higher ranked projects uh, that didn't move forward um, that Massachusetts uh, officials should have selected instead of these contracts. And that's the exact same thing New York should do, right? Is do an, R like do an open source RFP, see the kind of wind and solar contracts they're getting that actually provide benefits, that create jobs, that deliver real climate pollution reductions. Um, it would be a, it just, um, and then select those projects instead of Canadian Hydro is exactly what uh, should be going on here. And that's what we've been advocating for in both New England and New York all along here. Thank you for clarifying. Yes, RFP is request for proposal. Just in case some people don't know necessarily what an RFP is. Um, I, I just wanted to mention that, uh, you know, we have in Sierra Club Maine is certainly very active in looking to support microgrids and solar and wind in the state of Maine. Um, we're particularly interested in supporting off offshore wind and where properly sited onshore wind. Um, but our, uh, you know, we're the local micro uh, grids such as happened in Booth Bay are, are really valuable resources that are to be developed. And I, I we feel very strongly about that, um, that those have been overlooked and certainly CMP has uh, been unwilling to, you know, move forward or in court, neither has the PUC pushed those forward. And um, that would be both uh, very strategically um, uh, an improvement in security in our grid, um, as well as uh, really promoting local um, ec the uh, local economy. Um, so just just to mention that with you know as as Andy Andy I think you know that that was a question from you but um, thank you for asking that um, and it does seem as though local projects you know can really make a difference uh, in local communities such as in Denmark. Um, now I'm losing track of questions. Um, Uh, I, there's some questioning about local law 95, which that must have to do with New York because I don't know anything about it. So do you want to take that, Meg? Yes, local law 97, yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Meg. Oh, nice. Sure, sure. We did a, we did a webinar on this um, and it is local law 97, which is a very ambitious uh, greenhouse gas reduction um, law that New York City passed in 2019. Um, but unfortunately, at the last minute, Hydro-Quebec's um, lobbyists were able to get into City Hall and insert a provision in that law at the very last minute that allows Hydro-Quebec's Canadian hydropower to be used to offset mm -hmm. um, or be used instead of those deep energy retrofits. So the law requires building owners to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by conservation and efficiency and so forth or using renewables. But if they don't want to bother, say Trump Tower doesn't want to do any energy retrofits, they can buy offsets or renewable energy credits from Hydro-Quebec. So that was part of Hydro-Quebec's um, uh, you know, one of the, their schemes, one of the ways that they thought they would get their foot in the door to be part of this so-called clean energy, energy plan for New York City, along with getting the state level subsidies. So yeah, very concerned about that. And um, obvious greenwashing. Again, this is all a fraudulent greenwashing scam. Hydro-Quebec and none of the other Canadian hydro companies have ever provided a complete carbon accounting or greenhouse gas accounting of the direct emissions from their um, hundreds of different generating facilities. So Hydro-Quebec has 63 dam facilities in Quebec and Labrador that it uses to export electricity to the United States. And when it gets to Massachusetts, for example, the greenhouse gas emissions in Massachusetts inventory, greenhouse gas inventory, are accounted as zero. Uh, study after study, including Hydro-Quebec's own 
scientific studies, the one or two peer reviewed studies that they have done show that there are in fact greenhouse gas emissions created by the reservoirs and by the dam operations themselves. So Hydro-Quebec is getting away with this as are all the other Canadian hydro dam um, crown corporations and the Canadian government itself, the government of Quebec promote this um, scheme that this is low carbon or in some cases zero carbon and that we don't need to count any of the emissions from these 63 generating facilities. I saw a quote, um, I think last week in the newspaper by um, one of Hydro-Quebec's uh, media people saying, that's not the way it's done. We don't count emissions from our um, individual generating stations. Well, that is the way it's done. If you were a fossil fuel plant, you would have to measure the greenhouse gas emissions from your smokestack and you would have to comply with state and local regulations for reducing those emissions under various climate plans. Well, Hydro-Quebec can't just say, you know, we're low carbon and we're not going to provide you with any data from any of our generating stations. That is not the goal. We're in a climate emergency. We can't play shell games with Hydro-Quebec's emissions from its different generating stations. We need to know where that carbon is coming from. We need to know how much is emitted every time they raise and lower the reservoir and cause erosion and cause carbon sequestering forests to be flooded. So, you know, this is a climate emergency and this is just unacceptable greenwashing and fraudulent, you know, shell games in my mind. Yes, um, I agree completely. I was going to say, and never mind the boreal loss of the boreal forest, which is, you know, we can't, we can, we can't afford to lose. Um, let's see, there's, so there's a question about microgrids. Um, with, microgrids probably should be a, a community conversation of their own. Um, and it would be really great to highlight the one in Booth Bay, but even small hospitals can be microgrids. They're not, they're not necessarily batteries of themselves, in and of themselves, but what they do is reduce the cost of, and, um, of new transmission lines because you do a lot of the uh, sequestering of energy in, in the local community. Um, and I encourage you to look at the um, Booth Bay project where they um, put a lot of solar in, they installed a lot of LED bulbs, and they um, actually uh, froze ice um, in a sort of a reverse refrigeration uh, process uh, that they then used to cool buildings during the day. Um, and so they, which was a very old fashioned way of doing something, but it was a, a, new, a new take on an old fashioned process. Um, and they avoided um, a, a new transmission line to Booth Bay and the cost to those ratepayers of um, uh, millions of dollars. So I think it was $18 million that uh, it was going to cost and they, it cost them six. So um, in, the, in, you know, in that local area. So it, it's, and, and it generated a lot of business locally. So that's you know one advantage, but there's also you know we recently had a um, a community conversation about what's been happening on Isla Ho, and they have a um, an interesting, very interesting battery system that has been developed that I think could be used in many um, local communities that does not use lithium iron uh, ion batteries, but uses semiconductors. And I encourage you to look back at our um, archive of community conversations um, to, to hear more about that. Um, so, um, I don't know if there are any. Uh, so, Luke Truman is asking, do you know if the percent of electricity lost in transmitting the power from Canada to Massachusetts, uh, from Canada to Massachusetts or New York? Do you know anything about that? Oh, you, Meg, you answered that question. Um, oh, I don't know, maybe someone else does. I know there is line loss, but I don't know how much. Thanks for asking that, Luke. Of course. Um, okay. Well, um, are there are there we can we can find that out. I'm, pr I'm pretty sure that that answer we can come up with that answer. 
Um, are there any further questions? Um, well, I, I really appreciate everybody uh, joining tonight. It's been really interesting. Uh, of course, there's just so much more that we can learn about what's happening in Canada and happening here. And keep your um, eyes peeled on what's happening both in New York and in Massachusetts, but especially here in Maine. Um, and uh, it was such a great conversation. I want to mention um, a couple of things. One, uh, there is a citizens initiative again uh, against the um, uh, New England Clean Energy Connect project. Um, and there will be um, people collecting signatures at the polls um, for that project, um, for that citizens initiative. Um, many people in Maine have already voted, but if you haven't in Maine, please uh, consider signing that when you go to the polls um, and or uh, sign up to uh, collect signatures for that uh, a citizens initiative. Um, there will be also some information about a consumer owned utility. They, the language has not yet been released for that uh, citizens initiative, but that will also, there will be people at the polls talking about that as well. So I encourage you to um, consider uh, doing that. And then I think we have a slide. Um, oh, take action. Okay. Um, so uh, as you can see, you can email um, Governor Mills or Governor Baker um, about this project. We have certainly been advocating with the governors of uh, the New England um, governors and Eastern Canadian premiers to have them, um, to, to teach them about what we uh, do know. And um, hopefully we can persuade them to think differently. I don't know if Mark wants to quickly mention anything about that. But um, any work that any of you can do to reach out to the governors, we would be happy to, uh, we'd be happy to support you doing that. And I think this will be in the chat. Is that correct, um, Marina? So that you can uh, get these, this information. Yes, I'll, I'll save the chat for everyone. Okay, um, thank you. And um, then I think that there's another slide for um, an, an upcoming event. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, this, this I can. This is Meg. I can talk a little bit about this um, upcoming event. Um, we really want to encourage you to join us. It's going to be very exciting. Um, as you may know, the Conference of Parties, the UN um, Annual Conference of Parties, talking about climate agreements, has been um, postponed. It was supposed to be held in Glasgow, Glasgow, Scotland this year, but some groups are organizing. Um, side conferences um, and this is one that NAMRA is participating in along with our allies um, in Canada, Juan Iskatan, and with Damry Sisters from Brazil and Switzerland. It's called From the Ground Up and um, NAMRA with our Indigenous allies from Canada will be participating in a one-hour presentation on hydro dams and why Hydropower is a fall solution to the climate crisis. We will be joined by this year's winner of the human, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Award, um, an indigenous woman from Brazil, and again, our allies from Canada. So this will be a really interesting and exciting um, event. It's on November 14th, which is a Saturday, but we will be streaming it live on our Facebook page and we'll be sending out information about that. And we will be um, participating virtually and possibly um, in person at the uh, National Day of Mourning in Plymouth, Massachusetts uh, on Thanksgiving Day with the United Native Americans of New England and Indigenous community members from around the world who show up in Plymouth to talk about indigenous sovereignty and colonialism. So please join us on those events as well. Well, thank you everyone. Uh, it's been a really, really interesting. Um, and uh, there's further information in, in the, if you wanna save the chat, which um, you can click on, you know, the chat will allow you, allow you to save it if you click on the three little buttons, then you can save all the information that has been stored in the chat. Um, if you have further information, please feel free to get in touch with us at Sierra Club or uh, to NAMRA, uh, Sierra Club, uh, main chat, main.chapter at sierraclub.org. 
or um, email coordinator.namra at gmail.com. Um, and thank you so much to Mark and Kevin and Meg for this incredible uh, presentation. Um, yes, and Sierra Club has a um, annual celebration. We're showing the film tomorrow, um, which we will give people who, re who uh, register a uh, week to watch. And then there will be um, uh, a, a, an amazing list of folks talking about moving forward in a positive direction towards a new world that we hope we will be able to uh, engage in um, coming for going forward. So uh, if you'd like to register, it's um, uh, sierraclub.org slash Maine. You will find our annual celebration on the website. So thank you very much, everyone. And we really appreciate your coming tonight. Um, thank you, Meg, Kevin, and Mark. Really, again, appreciate your time. Thank you. And thank you for Marina and Julian for organizing us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, everyone. Appreciate everyone. it. Yeah. Okay. Good night. Bye. Bye.